Hello friends, you are looking at a chainsaw that is moving along the guide and sawing the board out of this log almost without the need for human intervention. Nothing unusual. The lumber milling device I'm presenting here is the simplest DIY semi-automatic saw mill for turning logs into perfect boards right in the woods. I've tried many methods for milling logs into boards with a chainsaw, so I have something to compare this method with. I will highlight the main advantages and disadvantages of this semi-automated milling technique. Due to the fact that the chainsaw moves along the guide mechanically without any human intervention, the milled board is perfectly flat. When I tried to push the chainsaw along the guide manually, I could not achieve such a quality cut even after multiple attempts. While changing a body position or making a step, one applies slightly unequal force to a saw's handle in different directions, and this is enough for the appearance of flaws in a deep cut. A self-propelled chainsaw is devoid of such drawbacks. The second advantage of such milling technique is safety. During the chainsaw's operation, a person stands aside in the safe zone in case a chain snaps, a saw's tank ignites, or a saw log jumps. Moreover, since the vast majority of my injuries are associated with fatigue, and this work is not tiring, the fatigue factor that increases the likelihood of injury is negated. In addition, while the chainsaw is automatically milling lumber, you can do other chores, such as stacking the sawn boards, preparing a new portion of a fuel mix, or sharpening a spare chain. However, this semi-automated method has its drawbacks. While using such a sawmill, it is advisable to mill only in a vertical plane. And of course, any automated device uses additional accessories that have to be made, installed on a chainsaw, attached to a log, and then carried from one log to another. So think for yourself if those additional preparations would be worthwhile in your particular case. However, it should be noted that the self-propelled sawmill has its advantages. Friends, you might have seen my old video, Two Chainsaw Secrets Turning a Tree into Perfect Boards, where I showed and explained in detail how any two-handed individual can cut the log into boards with a short bar chainsaw without using any special devices, just following a set of simple instructions. Over the past eight years, I've milled countless logs into boards and slabs. With such an extensive experience, I can sew a log into boards faster and even save fuel without using any additional milling accessories. Why do I need this adaptation then? The fact is that one summer ago, just as the whimsical Baron Munchausen, I accomplished the feat. I built a bridge across the stream near my log cabin. To do this, I had to cut a record number of boards from the hardwood of wind-blown pines. I was milling lumber for 20 days, 9 hours a day. I can't say that I was overly tired, but such enthusiasm played a cruel joke on me. My tenants turned out to be a weak link. I got epicondylitis on both hands and hadn't fully recovered since. So this past summer, I couldn't physically mill enough boards with injured hands for my pirogue construction project. Therefore, I tried to make my boat building task easier using a semi-automated sawmill. In other words, a self-propelled sawmill can save health for people like me who tend to get carried away at times. Had I had the semi-automatic sawmill back then, it would have kept me in a better physical shape. And one more consideration. You may have noticed that I made an extra long chainsaw bar to mill boards for my bent glued bridge at the log cabin camp. Short logs, say 3 to 4 meters, 10 to 15 feet can be easily sewn with a long bar without using the swinging motions milling technique. But it is a pain to cut an 11 meter 35 foot board from a log even with an extra long bar. I think you can guess why, but this is a topic for another day. So using such a semi-automated carriage with a chainsaw, anyone, even those who picked up a chainsaw for the first time, could cope with the task. Of course, there is no innovation in the chainsaw's carriage setup itself. What's new here is the rubber band that pulls this carriage. And I have to admit that this design was a bit of a problem. In other words, I didn't plan to make a self-propelled sawmill. 
It just happened that way. And here's the story how. I initially planned to cut the widest and longest boards for my pirogue from a thick, crooked log, which meant I needed to mill it from the root of the windblown tree to the top. Unfortunately, that tree fell in such a way that its crown remained on the top of the slope. I didn't risk to cut the log from its root and roll it down, so I had to mill it moving uphill, which was physically draining. I started to look for a technical solution to facilitate the task. Using a counterweight with a block or a thick bungee cord was the simplest solution. I had a few thick rubber bands cut from an old tire that I've been using on my treadle lathe and they never failed me for the past few years. Cutting a long elastic band from a tire is a matter of several minutes, but as practice has shown, the rubber band cut from a tire is noticeably inferior in elasticity to the usual braided bungee cord. Therefore, I went to the shore where my inflatable boat was kept, borrowed a bungee cord from the awning and installed it on the sawmill instead of the DIY rubber band. I'm glad that I did not complicate the design by using a block system. Rearranging the bungee cord's hook is a matter of a few seconds, unlike rearranging a system of blocks for each new log. After all, I needed to save time to be able to build the boat in 20 days, so I rigged a rubber band to pull the chainsaw uphill. The setup works just as well on horizontal logs. The rubber band contracts and moves the carriage with the chainsaw. And of course, to prevent the carriage with the running chainsaw from going too far and potentially dulling the chain, I installed a screw which serves as a stop for the carriage, kind of a foolproof device. It is impossible to share all the nuances in one video, but here's an interesting observation. Pay attention to this phenomenon. This chainsaw does not have a rubber band attached to it, but it is still moving along the log and mills the board. It is sawing the last pass and only milled about 60 millimeters, two and a half inches of wood, but still. A carriage loaded with a chainsaw can start the milling process just using its weight, even when there is two degrees of slope, while the battery powered chainsaw requires a slope of more than 10 degrees to get going under its weight. It's probably due to the vibration. Gas powered chainsaws scream, vibrate and mill while battery powered saws rustle. They also cut the log, but require more effort to move the carriage, which is especially noticeable when milling uphill. I hope I managed to interest you in my sawmill, and if so, it is time to tell the story of its creation and reveal the secrets of its simple design. It is worth noting that I spent most of this project's time making a collapsible guide rail. In my case, it is a long pine beam. I needed this guide to be divided into two parts, so it would fit into my boat and could be easily carried through the woods. At the same time, when assembled, the guide must be perfectly straight, without changing its dimensions in width and height. This means that the joinery assembly must be flush with the guide beam. The simplest solution for this goal is to mill grooves for two holding planks. As you can see, I hastily assembled this milling jig from scraps of plywood. It is important to make two passes when milling a groove. The second pass should be made turning the router jig 180 degrees. This way, the groove is guaranteed to be perfectly centered regardless of the jig's accuracy. I have to confess, I messed up the first blank by milling a groove deeper than planned. So I just glued in an insert and milled the groove again. Practice has shown that it is more convenient to move the router by holding on to the jig. What remains is to make the side holders from hardwood and one can assemble and disassemble the guide. The only requirement is that the holding planks must fit snugly into corresponding grooves. I also made short plugs so that the grooves are not damaged during transportation. To assemble the guide beam, you just place the inserts into the grooves and reinforce them with screws. That's all. The sawmill's carriage can be manufactured even faster than the guide. I used laminated plywood leftovers. I sawed two pieces of equal length and drilled countersunk holes every 10 cm every 4 inches. Then I attached these plywood side parts to the leftover piece of the beam that was used to make the collapsible guide and connected these three parts with self-tapping screws. 
The beauty of this design is that the carriage is immediately calibrated to the width of the guide as both corresponding sliding parts of the guide and the carriage are literally made from the same board. Now the carriage needs to be connected by a movable joint to a chain source guide bar. It is best to use a rotary axis for this purpose. It is important to drill holes strictly perpendicular to the side face of the carriage. This will ensure the coaxiality of the chainsaw's guide bar and the sawmill's guide beam. Hence, it will determine the success of the entire event. Therefore, I first drilled three 10 mm 3 8 holes using my drill press and only then did I finish them manually using a long twist drill bit. It is technically possible to attach a chainsaw to this carriage in three places – front, rear and in the middle – although I ended up using only one carriage's attachment point in the future. A 10 mm 3 8 threaded pin will connect the carriage and the chainsaw. And a second hole is now needed in the chainsaw's guide bar, which is easily drilled with a step drill bit using a little oil. As you understand, for full-fledged sawmill tests, it's not enough to have only one guide bar. So I prepared three chainsaw bars at once, one stock guide bar and two DIY long bars. I had to weld on an attachment knot on one of my homemade guide bars because the rational attachment point happened to be inside the void of this bar. So now it remains to paint the carriage and get to the field trials. As I said earlier, I decided to attach the chainsaw bar to the carriage through the rotary axis, but it shouldn't be too close to the carriage so that the chain would not saw the carriage itself. For this purpose, I made two spacers from the same laminated plywood using a hole saw bit and then enlarged the central hole to 10 mm 3 8 diameter. Using the edge of the first washer, it is convenient to lay out a cut and then secure the guide's position on the log with a regular screw. As you can see, it takes one and a half minutes to assemble this sawmill prototype from parts, and it would seem you can now mill a log into boards, but there are some nuances. As you know, the devil is in the details. Next, there will be an educational story about a cascade of reckless assumptions and then a search for a way to correct the mistakes using available means. Everything is as usual. As I said earlier, during the first minutes of testing, it turned out that pulling the chainsaw up the guide on the slope was extremely tiring. I bent the hook from a wire and attached the band to the carriage with this hook. It immediately became clear that for stable operation, a load was needed to stabilize the carriage on the guide. Testing this idea, I realized that the load was too small and that the rubber band's attachment point had to be moved up from under the chainsaw. As it turned out, the best option was to make removable mounts that would be attached to the rotary axis pin on both sides. I insist that it is necessary to pull the carriage precisely at the place where the chainsaw is attached to. This is the place where the main forces are being applied during milling. So in order to increase balance and not to accidentally veer off in the cut, it is necessary to pull the carriage by the rotary axis. It is not easy to mill a 50 cm log with a 40 cm guide bar. This is why I brought two extra long guide bars that I made at home. Now it would be nice to choose a proper weight for a carriage and find a way to secure it on the top. And you don't have to go far to find some pieces of wood to keep the weight in place. Remember. Last year I made a lot of huge wooden clamps to glue my bridge's bent supports. Now the clamps are not in demand and there are a lot of leftover pieces left from their production around the camp. Before I even started to think what to use as a weight, my eyes fell on the toolbox. The toolbox is heavy and has a convenient shape. If desired, you can fill it with sand or lead shot. Its weight can be easily regulated. As a bonus, the toolbox is similar in size to the carriage. It is only necessary to make side supports to secure it on the carriage so that it wouldn't be cut by accident, which could also damage the chain. Perhaps I'm talking about my spontaneous decision to use a toolbox as a weight in too many details. After all, the choice of the weight 
and how it is secured on the carriage has almost no effect on the operation of my self-propelled sawmill, just like an underlayment made from a plastic bottle under the chainsaw's body, which reduces friction and facilitates the movement of the saw along the guide. By the way, a drop of oil on the carriage's sole will not hurt the process. As you can see, the first trial cut disappointed me. I could mill boards free-handedly, getting a way better result. This board's quality is simply unacceptable for boat building. You might think that the problem was caused by a crooked guide bar. Indeed, last year I bent it a little during transportation, but replacing the bar did not fix the problem. It was assumed that the guide bar clutched between the two wide plywood washers of equal thickness and attached to the carriage's side cheek through them will automatically be positioned parallel to the guide beam. It would only be logical. I was so sure of these arguments that before starting work I did not even check the geometry of the chainsaw bar and the guide beam, assuming they were parallel. I sort of the first board with some problems, and with the next cut the difficulties only worsened. Only then I decided to check the geometry of the saw's bar and the guide. They were not parallel. It suddenly became obvious to me where the error crept in. The threaded pin's hole at the bottom of the carriage was unevenly morphed by the metal pin, which slightly shifted the saw's bar mount enough to alter the jig's geometry and affect the performance. I'm in a deep forest, far away from my workshop, and I can't make a metal insert for the carriage to house the rotary axis to prevent the hole drilled in the wood from being distorted. However, one can always install a spacer made from a plastic bottle under the crumbled edge as a temporary fix. As you know, there is nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. These spacers have served me well for a year now, and I won't be replacing them with the metal bushing anytime soon, unless I have to. Saying that, I consider it my duty to draw your attention to the fact that it is extremely important to ensure that the source bar is parallel to the guide. After fixing this error, everything started to work fine for me. I want to draw your attention to the quality of the shavings that are produced by the chainsaw that was mounted on the carriage. Undoubtedly, those are real shavings, not sawdust. The abundance of the long fibers suggests that the bulk of the material is removed along the grain, not across it. This ensures a more productive operation of the chainsaw when sawing logs longitudinally, which means such milling technique saves time, fuel, lubrication and prolongs the chainsaw's life. I dwelt on this issue in my other video about two secrets of milling a log into perfect boards using a chainsaw without any attachments. I will add only one thing. In my experiments, as evidenced by such long shavings, the chain's sharpening angle of 5, 10 or 30 degrees does not noticeably affect the quality of the cut and milling speed when sewing along the grain. However, the quality of the chain sharpening makes a big difference. After sewing the first log in the boards and making sure that the carriage could move along the log on its own, I realized that I needed the guide bar's attack angle adjustment mechanism with preset positions. An attempt to secure the guide bar's position by using a wedge or a piece of wood placed under the chainsaw's body proved to be a failure. I decided to approach the problem from another end and to use a pulling rather than pushing mechanism. To implement this idea, any improvised means are suitable. I managed to find perforated tin tape, some wire and a piece of rope. A piece of tin tape can be secured with a screw at the end of the carriage opposite from the chainsaw. It is easy to bend the hook from a wire, then tie it to one of the rope's end and then fasten the opposite end to the chainsaw's handle using a secure knot. Such a sawmill works most productively when cutting lumber with its toe part of a guide bar. Therefore, it is advisable to mill boards from a log in several passes. The adjustment looks somewhat flimsy, which is actually good as the sawmill's weak link becomes its safety feature. The rope can be easily torn off in case something goes wrong, preventing the sawmill's damage. When it comes to milling lumber, any additional safety feature is not excessive. As you can see, the design of my sawmill is not devoid of some nuances, but at the same time it is very simple in use and manufacturing. 
Of course, it can still be improved. You can add a handle to it for better mobility, or you can use something more compact than a rock, for example, a railroad tie plate. But in general, this self-propelled sawmill does not require refinements. Although perhaps in the future I will make a more technologically advanced version of this carriage and guide. But that's a completely different story. Friends, let's go back to the woods to watch the first field trials. I want to draw your attention to the quality of the board. If the first milled boards were somewhat of a mediocre quality, say grade 3, these ones are first grade boards. For a chainsaw mill, the lumber surface texture is at the highest level and the flatness is impressive along the entire length. This statement may seem like an exaggeration to you, but look at where and how exactly these boards were used and you will no longer have doubts. It was from these butt jointed boards that I assembled the sides of my boat. As always, I milled them from a wind blown log right in the woods. The very method of making a pirogue by bending its sides into an arc is extremely demanding on the material. Most likely, it simply wouldn't be possible to build the boat using lumber of irregular thickness or curved boards. But my pirogue came out quite strong and seaworthy, which means the lumber milled by my self-propelled sawmill met the increased quality requirements. From the first grade 3 boards, I assembled a less material demanding bottom of the pirogue. I think you will agree that the result of the work speaks for itself. I'm sure, after seeing all of my mistakes in building and using my self-propelled sawmill, you will also be able to assemble a floating craft from a wind-blown lumber, and I believe that you can do it just as well. Note, I built this pirogue when I wasn't fully recovered from epicondylitis, and I have no doubt that without the help of this sawmill, I would not have had time to build the pirogue from scratch in 20 days. A self-propelled sawmill was a great help at my log cabin camp lately. Considering that my free time for editing has noticeably decreased and the queue of filmed projects is only growing, leave your wishes in the comments which video you would like to see first. A video about my pirogue a video about building a bridge from curved glued arches, or maybe a sequel on my bottle hive bees that I was thoroughly filming for the last year. Friends, thank you for your support, both here on YouTube and on Patreon. It has freed up a lot of time so I could focus on filming my projects. This is Maxi Korov and let good people watch good videos. I hope to see you back on Advoca Makes.